Hello, I'm Dr. Alvis at Montgomery College where I teach Introduction to Linguistics and I'm going to review uh, nine common phonological rules in English. By phonological rules, I mean the subconscious processes uh, that result in uh, some phonetic changes uh, in the sounds that we produce based on the original phonemes uh, that become uh, allophonic variants. So phonemes are those uh, underlying more or less mental representations of sounds and the allophones are the sounds we actually produce but they sometimes uh, have slight differences from what's originally uh, the underlying form is. Uh, in this table you can see uh, the rule name and by rule, of course, we're talking about descriptive rules, not prescriptive rules in a grammar book. Uh, these are the things that just tend to happen or always happen in some cases uh, when pe uh, speakers are producing sounds. Uh, in this column, we have the uh, f formal rule notation as well as a uh, basic description in an English sentence. And then there's some samples here. Uh, some of the symbols used in this chart include the hashtag, which indicates the beginning or end of a word, uh, the dollar sign, which indicates the beginning or end of a syllable, and ungrammatical forms, which are indicated by an asterisk. And by ungrammatical, I mean simply that uh, that is not what we actually produce. And again, it's not a prescriptive grammar, but rather what is attested or not attested in uh, English speech. Oh, and in some cases there is variation, and I'll mention that along the way. So let's look at the first one. Aspiration of voiceless stops word initially, and by voiceless stops uh, I mean the sounds p, t, and k. Those are all voiceless, and they are stops in English. And so in this formal notation, voiced minus voiced plus stop uh, becomes uh, gains the feature aspiration plus aspirated, and it occurs in this environment, the environment of being uh, here, uh, right at the beginning of a word, right? And so a sample of that is pit, the p sound in pit, all right, is at the beginning of the word, and it is, uh, when we transcribe it uh, precisely, more a narrow transcription, it has aspiration, that small uh, superscript H means that it is aspirated pit. Now put your hand in front of your mouth and pronounce pit. Try it. Pit. And you can feel that puff of air. Try now holding your hand in front of your mouth to pronounce this without the aspiration. Pit. And that feels very strange. Pit. It sounds strange. It feels strange. We are violating this rule and it is therefore marked as ungrammatical. The same thing uh, applies to uh, the t in tie and the k in comb, and these are all aspirated at the beginnings of words, and it is strange not to. In other languages, which do not have this rule, they might have words which are indeed uh, not, uh, sounds which are indeed not aspirated at the beginnings of words. All right, so that's what we're looking at. Let's continue uh, with these other uh, rules. T and D, or rather the sounds T and D, become uh, tap or flap, the two terms, tap or flap are both fine, between stressed and unstressed syllables. So let's look at the formal notation. Uh, T and D are both alveolar, uh, they are both stops, and they become this flap plus flap. And it happens in the environment of being between a stressed and unstressed syllable. All right. So uh, alveolar stops become flaps intervocalically between stressed and unstressed syllables. So let's take the word writer. And so the, that has that pattern of uh, uh, being uh, stressed at the beginning, right, and then unstressed in the second syllable, ter. And the t sound is in the middle. And uh, as we know from the previous rule, it could be aspirated. And if you want to, you can pronounce writer, but that's not very natural, is it? It's inter in intervocalic position. It's going to be reduced a little bit. That's very common for sounds to be reduced intervocalically, uh, some feature, losing some features or something, changing so in some way. So we use this symbol here that looks like an R without its arm, kind of R, arm is cut off. And so pronounce this word quickly, writer. 
writer, and you can feel your tongue just barely flapping to the alveolar ridge at the top, of, uh, towards the front and top of your mouth. Now pronounce this word and pronounce it quickly. Don't try to hyperarticulate. Writer. So uh, writer, writer. Now you could, if you want, hyperarticulate it and say rider. He is a rider, not a writer. But that's not normally what we do and what happens normally subconsciously. Re uh, this becomes a little bit reduced. Okay, and the same thing for writing and divinity. So that's uh, those are that's one sample. Let's move to the next one. Uh, another rule that's pretty common and something you don't realize you're doing is nasalization of vowels. So any vowel plus vowel uh, gains the feature nasal uh, uh, when it is when there is a nasal right after it and uh, at the end of a syllable. All right. So let's take a look at that word uh, sample there, fan. And so what you don't realize when you pronounce the n mm, just before you do it, you have to. Uh, you're opening up the nasal passage. You're moving your your velum, and uh, when you do that, just before you pronounce it, it uh, becomes uh, what we call anticipatory. You anticipate that n, and in that uh, above the a vowel, you can see that tilde, which indicates nasalization. So fan. When you get to the n, which is nasal, of course, the vowel already be starts to become nasalized. And so in a word like homeless, the mm, uh, is nasal. That vowel bef just before becomes uh, somewhat nasalized. And in a word like singing, and that i becomes uh, nasalized. So basically, vowels are nasalized before nasal consonants at the ends of syllables. Uh, syllabification of sonorants uh, that include nasals and liquid sonorant sounds uh, have a uh, 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 almost vowel-like, uh, sorry, almost, uh, yes, vowel-like uh, sound to them, sonorant, so plus sonorant, uh, become syllabic, that is, they, they turn into their own syllables, they begin to have their own syllables, um, in the position of uh, af after another syllable, uh, but at the end of a word, all right, so uh, sonorants uh, become syllabified, uh, 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 after uh, other syllables. Okay. Oh, at the ends of words. And so, for example, the word widen. Now, you can try to pronounce it and hyperarticulate widen, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, the un sound doesn't need a vowel. And so we indicate that this is its own syllable by putting that little tiny dot underneath it. Widen mm, is its own vowel. And the same with the word pickle. O itself is its own syllable. Okay. Um, let's take a look at labialization uh, of our word initially. And so uh, 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 R is basically an alveolar liquid, and there are other terms that are used for this, uh, but it becomes labialized. It gains the feature labial at the beginning of a word, and so let's try that out. Uh, let's try it uh, with this word first, wrap. Try to pronounce that, wrap. And then notice the shape of your lips when you're pronouncing the R, wrap. And so we add this W to indicate that uh, uh, it's becoming labialized. And labialized basically means you are rounding your lips. And so uh, they become labialized or rounded at the beginning of the words. Try that again, wrap. But if you say the word far, R, it is not rounded, right? Far, and your lips start to spread apart. Try to pronounce rap, but when you do it, spread your lips out. Rap. Oh, it's really hard to do rap. That's not what we do. So that is really ungrammatical. This is a very common rule, something you've never thought of before, but that's what you're doing. Okay, velarization of L word finally. Okay, so L is a lateral sound. Uh, and it becomes, again, the feature velar, all right? That means velarized. And so velar means kind of going to the back, your tongue pushing back a little bit. That's uh, at the end of a word. So let's try this word. Pronounce this word real, real. Now, contrast that with the word lip. Say the word lip. 
And uh, when you do that, the uh, notice the position of your tongue, lip, and you can feel the tip of your tongue pushing towards the front of the mouth, touching that alveolar ridge, lip. Now pronounce, contrast that with the way you pronounce the L in real, and your tongue, the root of your tongue, the back of your tongue, kind of uh, uh, moves back a little bit, real. And so to indicate that this is velarized, there is, that's a little, it looks like that tilde right in the middle of that L. So that's a velarized uh, L sound, okay? And here's the same for the word tool, tool, not tool, and push your tongue all the way to the front, try to pronounce it as tool, and that sounds kind of weird, right? Uh, that velarization is what's happening. Uh, next, we have voicing of uh, we have voicing of the S sound word finally, and so uh, that S is a uh, alveolar sound. It is a fricative sound, and uh, it gains voicing uh, in uh, in the position where something is voiced in front of it, and it's at the end of a word. All right. Uh, so uh, let's see the description here. Uh, the the inflectional suffix S uh, becomes voiced z after voiced sound. So this applies to that inflectional sound, okay? Uh, so let's take a look at that word bag. And so in that word g is voiced. The It's not bags with an s pronunciation, but with a z pronunciation. It is voiced, okay? Uh, like that nasalization where uh, uh, it becomes nasal before nasal sound. In this case, it, uh, this, the S becomes voiced after a voiced sound, so another kind of assimilation. And of course, a vowel is voiced, so se, says, say, that is, of course, when we pronounce it as says, uh, not ses, it's voiced. Uh, by, buys, all right, not buys, Okay, so, uh, but again, this applies to this inflectional suffix, S. Uh, palatalization, uh, obviously becoming uh, palatal, and so it applies to uh, alveolar stops, the T, palatalization of T, uh, becomes palatalized before the Y sound, by the way, that sound Y, okay? So, uh, uh, it, uh, that stop, the alveolar stop, becomes a palatal affricate, plus affricate, plus palatal, um, and it happens before the plus high vowel, okay? And so some samples are, uh, again, this is a little bit more uh, of a almost grammatical type, right? Uh, don't you, and you can pronounce don't you, but it's very common in spoken English to pronounce don't you. Uh, aren't you? You betcha. And uh, I'm going to get you. All right. There's some other phonological processes that I'm skipping over, by the way. All of this together is a, is a complex combination of phonological rules. But in any case, it's a sample of, of a palatalization in process there. There's that palatal affricate or alveopalatal affricate ch. Okay, final rule here, lengthening of vowels, and so uh, a vowel becomes plus long in the environment of being uh, uh, bef uh, uh, before a uh, voiced consonant, all right? So vowels are lengthened before, uh, oh, I forgot to put the word stop there, so let's go ahead and add that. Okay, so let's consider that. Um, uh, consider the words bad and bat. Bad, kind of long. Try to pronounce it quickly, you can. Bad, but it feels weird. Uh, whereas bat, uh, try to pronounce that long. Bat, that's weird. Okay, what tends to happen is that this vowel after, uh, before a voiceless stop is shorter than one which has the voiced one. So bat and bad. Uh, Rope and robe, 
All right. So uh, that's those are some samples of phonological rules, and uh, I hope this uh, is not too confusing, and I hope you understand them and have some better knowledge about phonology and phonological rules as a result.